Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome everyone to the continuation of Surah Isra. I think I'm I'm so excited. I, I feel like um, we we had like this massive you know like to be continued. You know when you're watching like the best show you've ever seen, and it's like no wait. So I'm really excited. Um, you know some of us have a chance to discuss like you know afterwards just the impact and the weight of what it is that we're receiving. And I think what was so striking. You know, we were talking with the Sheikh about Surah Isra and its importance and what in it is essentially like the equivalent of the Ten Commandments that Moses received, except we're getting, you know, what it means, the commandments or the, you know, the constitutional elements or, you know, we're, we're kind of thinking about how do we even talk about this, it's so weighty. But what does it really mean to be Muslim? And when you think about this, this is so exciting because, um, you know, one of the challenges that I know that I face when I'm thinking about how to articulate what it is that we do here at Project Illumin is talking to Muslims and trying to convince them that there's actually something exciting about the Quran, that it has some kind of relevance to their life, that there is something that is not just medieval about it or that they should care. You know, you, you like look, you do any search and you see, you know, people talking about the Quran, that, oh, yes, there's this tafsir there, that tafsir there. So it creates a challenge because I know that what we're doing here is extremely special. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a good marketing challenge, right? It's like, how, how do you convince your audience that it's worth rethinking, that there is something new, something exciting? Um, but I think what's very cool is that, you know, people are discovering, people are spreading the word. And, um, you know, for us, we, we've been doing this for a very long time, but it's really gratifying when you, you start hearing back, you know, the excitement and the... Um, the discovery and just the the you know sparking again of like the love for the Quran and it's that that makes this work extremely um, you know exciting and, and, and gratifying so I for so to continue with Surah Isra it's like I want to know like what are the remaining constitutional elements because this actually is something new that that Project Illumin brings forth that's tangible that we can talk about because these are things that obviously have these are original these are things that have not been talked about before they have never been you've never heard them anywhere before because they've never been said anywhere before so in order to come forward and say this is what we're doing at project illumin this is how the quran makes you know a sense for our day and age um it's very exciting um to to start thinking about you know how can we share this so that we can get more people on board so, you know, as part of that, we really hope and ask that if you are excited by what you learn here, because now we've had so many surahs, I think we're on, what, 36, 37, 38, we're getting up into the high 30s. Um, every single surah is transformative, and there's so much that is, is out there to get excited about. Please share that with people that you know, that you think need to hear it, or that maybe are interested, or searching, or looking for something. You know, I think the, the organic word of mouth recommendations are the most powerful. And it's not just about, you know, growing usuli, although for us that's obviously, you know, a priority. But this is to help Muslims reconnect with their faith in a way that is meaningful, that touches their soul and their intuition and inspires them to be better people. I think that's really the point of what we're doing. And, um, you know, to fall in love again with the Quran and to know that there's something out there, you know, for people who are searching. Um, is, is very exciting and I think that when you share this with people who are searching, you know, that's your hasanat and, 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 and it's beautiful to see people grow. We've had people who, you know, have been following us for a very long time and you see how people blossom and you see how people are, you know, sort of let go of these mental shackles because I think Islam as it is today is very much a mental shackle. You know, you feel like you can't do this, you can't do that, oh my god, is this haram, you know, whatever. And um, I recently had someone tell me that since they've been starting, um, you know, to watch these halakas, that instead of just falling into that shackle of, oh my God, maybe I'm doing something wrong and this is haram, to feel actually empowered and enlightened to be like, wait, let me think critically about this. Actually, you know, God is beautiful. What would God accept of this? And, and you know, and that's, that's liberation. You've given someone liberation. So that's a, an incredible gift. Um, so anyway, um, Next thing, I'm very excited to announce, very hot off the presses, like li literally this was just in the last hour that we have decided to organize this. Um, we are going to hold a conversation on this coming Thursday at 2 o'clock um, between um, Sheikh and um, an incredible woman. Her name is Laura Elborno. I'm actually, I just got her bio. She's a Palestinian-American international lawyer and activist. 
based out of Paris, France. She holds a BS in psychology, BA in French and Arabic. She obtained her JD from Loyola University in Chicago and an LLM in European law from the Université de Paris um, too. Um, she works as a lawyer in Paris, splitting her time between acting as counsel in global disputes and pro bono cases, mostly involving refugee rights. Um, she speaks often about the Palestinian struggle for liberation and is the host of her own weekly English language podcast called The, Palestinian, the Palestine Pod. So if you are on social uh, media, on Instagram, um, her, her page or her handle is Gazan Girl. Okay, so if you, yeah, she's amazing and she's a huge following and um, she's been sharing a lot about what's going on in Palestine, um, both from an educational perspective because they cover a lot of stuff on their podcast, she and her partner, but also really heart-wrenching um, stories about her own family who are suffering in Palestine. And um, she is a, a brilliant, amazing person um, and so we're so blessed and so lucky to you know have um, had you know been able to just pull this together very quickly so we're um, I was just literally talking to Sheikh and, and we hadn't even I haven't even circled back to Laura but so it'll probably be um, like kind of an interview with me um, moderating and interviewing both of them in conversation about Palestine so it's gonna it can range everything from what's happening on the ground to um, what's happening in social media because she herself is coming under attack and her posts and her presence on Instagram is getting suppressed and you know under threat of getting you know eliminated she's showing you know like visual proof of what's happening the ethnic cleansing and then she's getting accused of showing you know like extremist images it's it's just really horrific but um, and then to you know and they obviously have a lot of background to discuss about law history theology and all of that so it's going to be a fabulous discussion so again this thursday two o'clock inshallah our time it'll be eight o'clock her time in paris um similar to the tark Don. so it'll be a zoom webinar i you know i'm going to put together the details and send it around so either you can join us live or you can watch the recording afterward and um hopefully it'll be amazing so um I think that is it. So, inshallah, looking forward to an amazing session today. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanallah al-Ali al-Azim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammad wa ala alih wa ashabih wa ta'ahu wa ihsanin ila yawm al-Din. Allahumma shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani afqaqam. Okay, so we are continuing, inshallah, with Surah Al-Isra, but I, I want to start with a recap before uh, picking off where we, picking up where we left off, uh, and inshallah you'll see that the recap is important. So as we said, the old Surah Al-Isra, it, it begins with a single ayah about the Isra and Mi'raj itself. In affirming it, confirming it, and we already talked about the ideological, the social impact of the Isra wal Maraj coming at the time that it came. But at the same time, it was clearly affirming the foundational premise that Muhammad's message, alayhi salatu is but a continuation of the message of, of Ibrahim alayhi salam and uh, the Kaaba in Mecca I wouldn't say, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the Kaaba in Mecca only makes sense in light of the Masjid in Jerusalem the Masjid in Jerusalem was a symbol of monotheism and it and it, 
one of the most fascinating things, I didn't uh, uh, focus on this last time, but one of the truly mass fascinating things is that the temple, the uh, Israelite temple, whether the first temple or the second temple, had been destroyed. And so what was there before uh, Muslims conquered Quds? When the Quran refers to Masjid al-Aqsa alladhi barakna hawla, it's referring to a symbol of monotheism that remained in Jerusalem. Now, whether that uh, th there's no ar archaeological evidence and only historical conjecture that the temple and the mosque are built on the same location. Um, but we, the, the fascinating thing is that the, what was referred to as al-Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, where eventually Umar ibn al-Khattab builds the Aqsa Mosque, or lays the foundation for the, for the Aqsa Mosque that we have in, the, in different, its different transformations today, um, is a structure that is affiliated with the Prophet Ibrahim and the lineage of the Prophet Ibrahim, and it's a symbol of monotheism. Um, but it is not part of the Roman Church, not part, obviously, of the Coptic Church, and not part of the Abyssinian Church, which was for a long time under... Well, anyway. So, not part of any of the Christian churches. Um, as far as we know, a very loose association with what is known in Arabia as the Ahnaf. These are people that believed in the religion of Ibrahim, but who were not Jews and not Christians. And it is we have evidence that the Ahnaf revered um, the prayer area, or what they called masjid as well, in Jerusalem, uh, we, ha we know that there are small groups of Arabs that would, who uh, affiliated themselves with Ibrahim, السلام, who would travel to the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, not like that idiot uh, Yusuf Zidan, um, and his Israeli master say a, a mosque somewhere in, in Arabia. Um, so we, we know that there is a form of pilgrimage and there is an awareness that the, the Aqsa Mosque, the mosque in Jerusalem, or that prayer area in Jerusalem, resembled the prophecy of Ibrahim. And so It is clearly now saying that this prophet, although not an Israelite, and for us in modern age, this is, you know, we, we don't consider this a big deal, but back then it was a very big deal, that Muhammad, although not an Israelite, his entire message, take it or leave it, is part and parcel of the tradition the Abrahamic tradition, and that he is indeed in the line of prophets of Moses, Joseph, as the Quran stated time and time again, but now it is laying the foundation for Muhammad being the last prophet, because Muhammad says that in the Isra wa Maraj, my relation to the other prophets is that I am the final articulation of the message, and this is the final revelation. So, 
when we talk about the movement, the apostasy movements, the, those who apostated, part apostated because they didn't want to believe in the Isra or Maraj itself, that he traveled to Jerusalem and back. But also, now, the line of demarcation is being drawn that this is the final message and the final prophecy and there is nothing beyond. Which um, had its own impact at the time in a variety of ways because some Arabs, um, especially among the Ahnaf, believed that prophecy will continue till the end of times. And that the, the there will be pro, God will be sending prophets till the end of times. Uh, some had a difficult time understanding why the Quran would be God's miracle and God's final miracle. Um, but as we will see in Surah Al Isra itself, the, the Quran addresses that. Sort of anticipates this objection and addresses it. Okay. And then we talked about how the reference to the Israelites, Allah knows fully well that the question will be, well, the entire legacy of the Israelites building the first and building the second temple. And in Surah Al-Isra, the Quran seems to be addressing the Israelites themselves, although in Mecca itself, there, there aren't any significant number of Jews. The, the Jews that exist in Mecca are individuals, uh, not parts of, of collectivities. But clearly, rebutting the idea that there are an entitlement of a chosen people and setting what will become a common theme in the Quran, that God chooses a people to perform a mission. If they do good, God sustains them. But if they fail God, then God replaces them. And even vis-a-vis -vis the Jews themselves, the Quran says, وَإِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنْفُسِكُمْ وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا That even with you, if you fulfill your covenant vis-a-vis -vis God, God will support you. If you don't, then God will let you go. And then after accomplishing that in I mean it, it's a feat of eloquence that it is done in such few pages, with such few words. The Quran moves on in Surah Al-Isra to lay down a set of ethical rules. And it is critical to remember that all the Muslims back then did not know that this is what's coming next is a migration to Medina and the building of a state. But it clearly anticipates the moral foundation for any collectivity, any project that Muslims will, un will take on. Um, so the significance of these moral rules that are set out in the Quran I, I compare them to a constitutional foundation because they are constitutional principles. It, it is after this journey, educational journey, it is now these are the basic principles upon which all else is built. Before I summarize these principles, um, it would be useful I, um, to take one 
one of the summaries uh, that emerged in the tradition, Islamic tradition itself. So in one of the tafsir, it's known as taf uh, Tafsir al-Najmi. The um, Najmuddin al-Kubari says that in Surah al-Isra, Allah laid out ten basic moral maladies. And as Allah laid down ten basic moral maladies, Allah juxtaposed these ten moral maladies with their moral cures, if you will. So what are they? And here I'm going to just very quickly read from the Arabic and paraphrase. So the first, this is according to the, this tafsir. The first is al-bukhl, um, stinginess or miserliness. And obviously the, the opposite of that. Um, is the moderation that Surah Al-Isra calls for. The second, what he describes as an amal, and he's, وَهُمَا فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ خَشْيَةَ إِمْلَاقِ فَإِنَّ الْبُخْلُ وَطُولِ الْأَمَلِ حَمَلَهُمْ عَلَى قَتْلِ أَوْلَادِهِمْ فَدَلَّهُمْ عَلَى تَبْدِيلِهُمَا بِالسَّخَاءِ وَالتَّوَكُّلِ So he says, although he, Amal here is hard to translate, but it, the second is um, it, I would I would translate as entitlement. So, and he, what he is referring to here is the the Quranic revelation: "Don't kill your children," and he's saying that it is both stinginess and a sense of entitlement as to how you share the material wealth in life that drove these people to kill their children. So the first would be miserliness, the second would be entitlement, what he calls an amal. Okay, third, is what he describes as a shahwa. A shahwa. Wahiya fi qawlihi ta'ala wa la taqrabu zina innahu kana fahishatan wa sa'a sabila. Fa inna ghalabat al shahwa yurisu zina. Fa baddalaha bil ifa hina nahaw ma'an al zina. So the third is um, unrestrained sexual desire. And this is in Surah Al-Isra when Allah says, don't come near zina, which we've talked about. And the juxtaposition or the cure to uh, shahwa, where unrestrained sexual desire, is iffa or purity, sexual purity. Okay, fourth. He says the fourth moral malady is al-ghadab. وَهُوَ فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ فَإِنَّ إِسْتِلَاء الْغَضَب يُورِثُ الْقَتْلِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ فَبَدَّلَهُ بِالْحِلْمِ فِي قَوْلِهِ وَمَنْ قُتْلِ مَظْلُومًا فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيهِ سُلْطَانًا So fourth, according to this source, is anger. Because he says it is when people don't learn to restrain their anger is when they commit murder. And the juxtaposition to anger is hilm or um, patience and benevolence. The fifth moral melody is al-israf. وَهُوَ فِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى فَلَا يُسْرِفْ فِي قَتْلِ إِنَّهُ كَانُ مَنْصُورًا فَإِنَّ الْإِفْرَاطِ فِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ يُورِسُ الْإِسْرَافِ فَبَدَّلَهُ بِالْقِوَامِ So, 
uh, and israf is excessiveness. Uh, and excessiveness, whether in the way you spend money or excessiveness in demanding even revenge. And you're saying that it, 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 the and the answer to to excessiveness is a principled moderation. Six. والسادسة الحرص وهو في قوله تعالى ولا تقربوا مال اليتيم فإن التصرف في مال اليتيم من الحرص فبدله بالقناعة بقوله إلا بالتي هي أحسن حتى يبلغ أشده uh, so six would be um, coveting حرص here is coveting what you're not entitled to and what and he's saying that this is exemplified in coveting or stealing the, the money of an orphan. Because you haven't learned to restrain your, your, your desire, your coveting of material things. It's what leads to a stealing of uh, the money of an orphan. And the answer to that is qana'ah, or qana'ah is... Um, um, how do you translate that? Um, being satisfied with what you have, I guess, it, it, uh, acceptance of of your share in life, that's qana. Okay. Sevens. نقد العهد فبدله بالوفاء بقوله وفو بالعهد إن العهد كان مسؤولا. So seven is the moral malady of violating your covenant and he juxtaposed it and replaced it by loyalty eight al khiana fabaddalaha bil amana wawfu bil kayl in kiltum wa zinu bil qistas al mustaqim thalika khayrun wa ahsanu ta'wila and here he's saying al khiana is treason and interestingly what he he sees as pointing to that moral malady is the Quranic in Surah Al-Isra the Quranic verse on don't cheat in scales um, and he says it's a form of treason to cheat and God demanded instead of treason a manna uh, uh, which is um, what's a man? Trust. Uh, tr being yeah, trusty. Be being trustworthy. Okay. Nine. And a typical of Islamic sources, he, he on nine he goes a long time because nine is a zulm injustice. Uh. But I'll read just a part of it. فَالتَّاسَعَ الظُّلْمُ وَهُوَ وَضْعُ الشَّيْءِ فِي غَيْرِ مَوْضِعِهِ بِاسْتِعْمَالِ الْجَوَارِحِ وَالْأَعْضَاءِ عَلَى خِلَافِ مَا أَمْرَهُ وَذَلِكْ فِي قَوْلِهِ وَلَا تَقْفُوا مَا لَيْسَ لَكْ بِهِ عِلْمُ فَبَدَّلُهُ بِالْعَدْلَ بِقَوْلِهِ إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصْرَ وَالْفُعَادَ كُلُّ ذَلِكَ كُلُّ أُولَئِكَ كَانَ مَسْؤُولًا كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولًا um, So he, he's saying, so the night is injustice. And injustice is anything that you use out, out of order or uh, uh, out of its proper place. So it, it is injust. It's even injustice to you to misuse your eyes or to misuse your ears or to misuse your tongue. That's a form of injustice. And of course, instead of injustice, God demands justice. And ten is al kibar, wa huwa fi qawlihi wa la tamshi fil ardi marha. So ten is arrogance. And as we know in Surah Al Isra, where Allah says, "Don't, don't walk with with great hubris upon the earth, 
because you're not going to be going to be as long as as tall as the as, as heavens, and you're not going to, uh, you know, tear through the earth, which as I as we talked about is idiomatic to, you you know, don't, don't think you're all that. You're you're regardless of who you are, you're never as important as you think you are. And so what's important here is here is a precedent in one of the Islamic sources where they clearly see that Surah Al-Isra is laying out a, a constitutional moral foundation for being a Muslim going onwards from there. And in, in his view, in this, in this view, it can be distilled into 10 moral maladies and what would solve these 10 moral maladies. Um, of course, he, I mean, you, you would need to know a lot about the, the, the author and his own background. Um, um, and it's expressed within the language of his age. He's from the 12th century. But if I would summarize the moral injunctions of Surah Al-Isra, this is the way I would summarize them. One, worship one God, or Mudullah. Two, don't ever punish one for the sins of another. Because accountability is personal. An individual. Three, honor your parents. Four, take care of your blood relatives. Five, take care of the destitute and poor. Six, Take care of Ibn Sabil or the wayfarer, as we said, the refugee and the displaced and the dispossessed. Seven, do not spend to excess and do not be miserly. Eight, do not kill your children. Nine, do not commit adultery or fornication. Ten, do not commit murder. Eleven, do not usurp the money and property of orphans. Twelve, observe your obligations and your promises. Do not break your promises or obligations. Ufu bil ahud. Thirteen, do not cheat in measures or in trade or in commerce. Ufu bil kail. Fourteen, do not speak about what you do not know. And do not deal in heresy and conjecture. Fifteen. Fifteen. Do not be arrogant. Full of hubris. And finally, when you speak, speak kindly and only speak good. So do not spread rumors and do not, do not slander.
this is a summary of basically what surah, the, the ethical code that Surah Al-Isra comes with. Now, whether you take the approach, the more the traditional approach of these, you know, the ten maladies or a more literal approach is what I've laid out. But the style of the Quran, Quran, the Quran always, if it gives you history, it always ties it back to the essential and core issue of belief in one God and gratitude and our relationship to this one God. And if it talks about ethics, it does the same thing. You will never find the Quran talking about ethics or telling you a story in history without tying it back again and again to the prophecy of Muhammad والسلام, and our relationship to the one supernal and eternal and absolute reality and that's our maker and so Surah Al-Isra sets out this these ethical rules but then it moves on to address various issues that define our relationship to our maker and indeed to existence itself. So as we said last time, it goes on, for instance, to talk about creation and that everything in creation is alive. And everything in creation is in communication with its Lord. And so if you act in this creation, you must be fully aware that you only have power to do or not to do as given to you by your Lord, but never beyond. Similarly, it lays out another layer of reality that your relationship with the Quran itself is part of negotiating your relationship with creation. That when you read the Quran, when you deal with the Quran, when you interact with the Quran, you are directly structuring and restructuring the reality that you live in so that وَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ قُرْآنَ جَعَلْنَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ حِجَابًا مَسْتُورًا that you actually construct a hijab or Allah constructs a hijab so you are constructing influences if you will you are constructing in our language in the modern age the psychic energy around you in the way that you deal with the quran the way that you deal with the responsibility of information will either make the shaitan a part of your life or or excluded from your life if you gossip if you resent people if you're jealous of people if you talk about people if you're angry at people as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and as we talked about a shaitan that the shaitan comes in and is empowered in your relationship and this applies whether you are talking about friends you're talking about family you're talking about spouses you're talking about children you're talking about parents it, it is you what? 
know how that happens. Is it Sharif? Oh, yeah, yeah. Nido? No, I'm worried a dog is Oh, sorry, we, we just, uh, you want to tell, tell them? Yeah. Um, uh, tell them what happened. The garage door opened, so we'll take a... Just, just give us one minute. Yeah. Uh, we, we want to make sure the dogs don't escape. Don't escape, yeah. Sorry. This is, uh, no, this is a good example of a devil attack. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to, to, to calm our beards so we can be stay calm. <laughs> you can't see any dogs, they're not out. No, no one is they open the But it, is it a coincidence that right as we are saying, Shaitan Yanza Hubaynahum, boom. Yeah. Did, did one of the dogs really escape? I don't know. How did the garage open the other one? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, he did. What happened? It was Doogie. He escaped. Did he do that? He did it? He like hit the... Hit the... He does thing. what I do then? I guess so. Has he done that before? No, they have to... It was Doogie. Doogie and Sharif went and chased after him. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, he got him. He That's like never had, happened before. That's never happened? Never happened before. <laughs> Oh, so great. He yeah, was like, who did opened the garage? Him? He did, yeah, he brought him in. Okay, we're going back. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so a it, 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 it dog did escape. Somehow the dog uh, opened the garage door and ran out, and Sharif had to run after him and get him. Um, and this has happened, never happened before, so... It's because you were on a good part. That was yeah. a devil attack. That's a, that's that was a, a classic full devil, devil attack. attack. This is like that time in uh, Thousand Talks when the electricity was, yeah. Right, right at the critical moment. Where is she? She's coming. So he did jump and just... Uh, he must have this how how else out. could it have opened? I mean, unless you have a supernatural explanation, that's the only explanation. <laughs> yeah, I I think it's supernatural. <laughs> of course you do. Sure, if you can hit the lock in, down there in the garage. On the garage door. Yeah, there's usually a lock button. Mm -hmm. well, I think the gin gin opened the. Hit the garage door right at the <laughs> critical moment. <laughs> oh my god. Where is the dog? Now he knows. We're, ju we're just waiting for Grace. She might be blocking the thing off, so it doesn't oh. call in with clusters. She should just hit the lock button. But can't it still? I mean, at least button. it's one extra step before he hits the button. Yeah. That's true. That's so strange. How would Doogie figure out to open the garage? Dude, at least he didn't run that way. No, but it's like up on the thing. Like that means that he like got up and touched it, right? It's on the wall. Yeah. That's very weird. Yeah. But. Supernatural. <laughs> But we still we still we still have to say more about the devil, so we might have another thing happening. We're not done quite done with the devil yet. Oh, great. I am. <laughs> what do you say? He said, I, I am. Oh yeah. <laughs> To run out. <laughs> Doogie got up? Yeah, but Street went and we're fine, we're good. He's, you know. He hit the garage door button, right? He jumped, he probably jumped up and hit the button. Open the garage door and escape. Shadeen said there's a button on it that you can lock. 
Uh, Usually there is. Once we have a gate, it won't matter. But oh, true, true. We don't have gate right now. <laughs> okay, so we were talking about the devil. Okay. Um, so, where was I? Um, where was I? Oh, okay, so first the, the, the tasbih of creation, the mediating or, or relate, or, or relating to reality through the Qur'an and the hujub al-Qur'an and the, um, the, the, the empowering of the demonic in your life. And as I was saying that, the, the Qur'an reminds us that the shaytan can insani aduwan mubina, that the demonic and again, when the Quran says the shaitan, it doesn't just mean say, just Satan, but all the demonic. And the demonic could be jinn and could be human. Uh, that the demonic is an arch enemy of humankind. Okay. So, and this is where we left this, where we left off last time. The the. The part where in Surah Al Isra, um, addresses your attitude towards Ihsan. Uh, when Allah tells you, وَقُلِّ عِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ That tell, tell them to say what is ahsan, what is beautiful, what is good. Ahsan comes from the word hasan, which means the good, the beautiful. It's an, an attitude, an attitude of what do you want to spread? What do you want to create around you? What, what, what do you want to, do, to have define your relationship? Because you could define things by an attitude of resentment, anger, uh, a sense of injustice, a sense of um, um, entitlement, or what there are numerous possibilities, but it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that. You want to achieve the ethical code that Surah Al-Isra lays out. That pursuing the path that minimizes the role of the demonic in your life is, an abs is absolutely necessary. I'm not going to go verse by verse because this will take us too long, but I am going to go to the verses where um, you have the most important issues. So next, we should talk about a verse 60. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then from 52 to, to, about, to 59, it, Allah is talking about how um, Allah is talking about the, sending the prophets before Prophet Muhammad and how Dawood, David was given Zabur or the, the Psalms. Um, and uh, and then the, the the Allah warning us that before the end that every 
every group of people will go through a the cycle of rising and falling and then ultimately the fate of all is the same in the year uh, in in the final day then it comes to surah to ayah 60 wa idha kunna lak inna rabbaka ahata bin nasi wa ma ja'alna ar-ru'ya allati raynaka illa fitnatan lin nasi wa ash-shajarata al-mal'unata fi al-qur'an wa nukhawwifuhum fama yuziduhum illa tuhyanan kabira the reason i'm pausing at 60 I want to look at the translation. Um, it's for two reasons. And remember when we said unto unto you, surely thy Lord, encom- Lord encompasses mankind or humankind. We did not ordain the vision that we showed you save as a trial for humankind and the accursed tree in the Quran. Um, وَالرُّؤْيَا الَّتِي أَرَيْنَاكَ Here, the, the, the Qur'an is talking about the vision that we showed you. And the reason this uh, gains some importance in, in uh, discussions is the traditional sources talk about whether is this referring to the vision of Al-Isra wal Ma'raj? when Allah is telling the Prophet the vision that we showed you. And some argued, you remember I said that there are some who believed that the Isra and the Mi'raj, both parts, the horizontal and the vertical, uh, were spiritual, not physical. Uh, a lot of the, the that school of thought points to this area and say, says, see, it was a vision that he saw, not a physical transformation. Uh, those who disagreed said, no, because a ru'ya al-lati arayinaka could mean what you saw. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was just a vision, not a actual physical uh, journey. As I said, I, I'm just not that whole physical spiritual debate doesn't really is of no great consequence in my opinion. Um, I mean, if you if you believe in, 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 in a God that controls the laws of physics, then, the, then why is it such a stretch that, that God can do anything? I mean, it's just... Um, okay, so that's one, is this whole thing about the vision that we showed you. And, you know, is it... Uh, and you find in some sources they go into a long discussion about this, but the other thing was Shajarat al-Mal'una fi al-Qur'an the accursed tree the Qur'an <coughs> referred to Shajarat al zaqqum which is referred to in the Qur'an as a terrifying tree and a tree in hell in, in hellfire um that, of course, we, we have no frame of reference for it other than what the Qur'an says. And what the Qur'an says is that it's a terrifying tree and that it, in fact, looks like that when people see it, it looks like as if, uh, like, like carrying the heads of demons. And that whatever grows out of this tree is tastes horrible and makes people feel horrible and it's just generally bad news. There are narratives in the tradition that say that some of the Meccans mocked the Quran saying how could there be 
the tree in Hellfire. Um, and any tree in Hell would burn. So how could there be a, a tree in Hellfire? And uh, this area basically in, affirms the idea of the accursed tree, one. But second, it, it says that I'll, I've mentioned it to warn them, to uh, to scare them. Now, this gave, in, in, again, in the, in the tradition, you find a lot of richness, and this gave, this gave rise to a, a whole debate. Um, is that, does this mean that nothing, none of the descriptions of hellfire can be taken as literal? Because a fire, a fire in hell is not like the fire we know on earth. And pain in, in hell is not like the pain we know on earth. That, or, that basically Allah is warning human beings about a severe punishment, but that understanding the severe punishment in literal human terms is flawed. While others said, no, it simply says that there is a tree in hellfire and that they should be scared of this tree. You know, again, I'm, I'm not going to pause. This is not a, a, a huge issue um, because I, I hope that none of us want to take the risk of finding out firsthand whether God meant things literally in hell or not. Um, I always thought it's sort of a strange debate. Okay. Then, next. Then, so, Surat al-Isra reminds us of something that we've encountered before, and that is that basic narrative about how Allah honored human beings and chose human beings for a role and that role meant bearing the heavy weight of responsibility and the heavy weight of responsibility is the responsibility of choice and that Shaitan rebels against this by, as in Surah Al-Isra repeats or reminds Muslims that um, how could that Allah karama or honored or elevated um, human beings to a status that Shaitan saw as completely unwarranted and unjustified because of the material that human beings were created from as opposed to what the material that Shaitan was created from. But what is noteworthy is in Surah Al-Isra, the way that the role that Shaitan then, the, 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 the role that the demonic is to target human beings as described. So, in 62, uh, he, so Shaitan said, you see this that you have honored above me, uh, I will surely gain mastery over their progeny. All save a few. لَأَحْتَنِكَنَّ ذُرِّيَّتَهُ is literally like um, I will target the progeny of human beings and 
I will gain absolute control and mastery over the progeny of human beings, illa qalila, except for a few. So, Allah responds to this, or at least in the in in the whether that that dis- that discussion actually took place or whether it's. It's um, uh, for the purpose of conveying the lesson to us. So it says, okay, well, your fate and their fate is known, those who follow you. But then in 63, or is this, no, sorry, 64. So inside whomsoever you can among them with your voice and bear down upon them with your cavalry and your infantry and dear and be their partner in wealth and children and make them promises Satan promise them not but delusion this if, if I it's hard to 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 express how much is written in Quranic commentaries about about just this portion of Surah al-Isra. Well, obviously, it's not the issue. Is not that Satan Satan doesn't have cavalry, doesn't have horses. It, it's all symbolic. But Satan does have armies and does have armies of jinn and humans, not just jinn. Humans, beings themselves, can become shayateen, can become as if demons or actual demons. And the relationship that Surah Al-Isra warns us, and, and you must read this warning in relation to the ethical code that Surah Al-Isra gave us earlier, is a relentless assault by the demonic. وَشَارِكْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ وَعِدْهُمْ that the demonic seeps into everything, in the way we relate to money, in the way we relate to our most intimate relations. Except, and this is where, إِنَّ عِبَادِي لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهُمْ سُلْطَانُ وَكَفَى بِرَبِّكَ وَكِيلًا Except for, that those who have a relationship with their Lord, you have no authority over them, and you have no mastery over them. And God is a sufficient protector. The way this was understood is that that ethical code that Surah Al-Isra set out, the constant difficulty in achieving the ethical code will be the role of the demonic. And the role of the demonic basically, again, is surrendering to your most base desires and your most base impulses. And it is only with a vigilant resistance of the demonic that you can achieve the ethical code. So don't take the ethical code itself for granted. Okay. So then after that, again Allah reminds us that our relationship, the, 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 the pitfall in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when we negotiate that relationship purely through the prism of self-interest. And it is exemplified in the metaphor of those who are in trouble. That when they are in trouble, they pray to God very 
sincerely. And, you know, when they need something, when they're out of a job, when they're, their loved one is sick, when they're sick, when, when they're in danger, they're on a ship about to drown, they're on a plane that's about to crash, they're, whatever it is. They pray very sincerely, but that human beings forget very quickly. And the minute that they relax, they go back to their old habits. And Allah reminds us of the obvious. And أَمْ أَمِنْتُمْ أَنْ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِيهِ طَرَّةً أُخْرَى فَيُرْسِلْ عَلَيْكُمْ The obvious. How do you know that you're not going to end up in the same precise hardship that you were so sincerely praying to God to save you from? How do you know that you're not going to end up in the relationship of need before the greatest need of all when you're dead and resurrected? Okay. It is that, as if that most elementary basic reminder is core to the realization of the ethical code that's laid out in the beginning of Surah Al-Isra. Okay. Then, this is now at 73, 74, and 75. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet, والسلام, that we know how difficult this is for you. And remember the circumstance under which Surah Al-Isra was revealed. We've talked about this. And so, we know how difficult this is for you, and we know that because, especially after the death of his uncle and the death of his wife, and seeing Muslims suffer in mass, many of them starving some to death under the mass persecution and what he suffered from after he tried to go to um, Thaqif and find, and we've talked about this, um, when, when he is... Uh, stoned and chased out of the town and so on. And it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it's, it's on the Prophet, we know that because of all of this, you وَلَوْلَا أَنْ ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِتَّ تَرْكَنُ إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا You nearly weakened and accommodated them a little. Now, do we know how, what precisely is the Quran talking about? There are various narratives that say that um, that the prophet thought of accommodating some of the requests in order to alleviate in return of alleviating some of the suffering upon of his followers that he would stop preaching uh, to people who come out of town under certain circumstances in return they would allow some food and commodities to reach his followers because there was a complete boycott of all Muslims and and so on. And other reports say no, it was that under the, the constant pressure placed on the Prophet and them demanding that the Prophet have a miracle like the miracle of Jesus and Moses, 
that the prophet started wishing that God would send him a miracle, like the miracle of Jesus and Moses, that would, you know, be... Some said, and this is a, a, a report that you don't hear about in the modern age much, that because when the prophet saw some of the people that he was close to, apostate, that the prophet wished that the Isra and Maharaj never happened. And interestingly, I mean, they, they, what was demanded of these people, of these men was remarkable. God's comment about this is that, well, we know that, but if you would have, in fact, obliged them in any of these situations, whatever the situation was, whatever the true report is, your fate with us would have been miserable. Because as, as the Quran makes clear, we would have this, by the way, is this, we consistent with the standard that is always that the Quran expects of prophets. Okay. Now, so this theological point is made up till 77 and then clearly Surah Al-Isra is reaching its conclusion and what is Surah Al-Isra after having warned you about the role of the devil and having warned you about and as especially the Sufi ask the Fasir point out the role of psychological defeat, spiritual defeat, it is one thing for you to respond to extreme pressure by phys physically accommodating something, but it's another for you to be spiritually defeated. Then Surah Al-Isra makes a shift that we've seen in several suwar before. And that is to underscore what is methodologically necessary to live the type of ethical life that the Quran has set out for its followers. So in 78 we find Surah Al-Isra then shifting to prayer. أقم الصلاة لدلوك الشمس إلى غصق الليل وقرآن الفجر إن قرآن الفجر كان مشهودا ومن الليل فتهجد به نافلة لك عسى أن يبعثك ربك مقاما محمودا وقل ربي ادخلني مدخل صدق واخرجني مخرج صدق واجعل لي من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا وقل جاء الحق وذهق الباطل إن الباطل كان ذهوقا So from what is it um, 78 to 80 All of this is built upon a foundation of Aqim salah prayer. But it is not just it is not just the prayer that we know that the the five prayers are finalized upon the Isra wal Maraj. That it is after the Isra wal Maraj, it is the five prayers, it is the point. Where the Prophet ﷺ says, okay, now it's finalized. You have five prayers a day, or five prayers that you must perform a day. Whether they're performed five times or in three times. But 
But pray. Let us see how that is translated. Pray at the point where the sun is coming down until the darkening of the night. Because some said, well, th this is just underscores the, the, the prayer times. No, it's not true. It's pray when the sun is coming down until the darkening of the night. Quran and Fajr and recite Quran at Fajr because this is specially blessed and at night they, they just translated as visual what the Hajjad it translated and keep visual in prayer for part of the night um, it's, it's literally to stay up in at night praying. So we know at one level it's speaking to the Prophet والسلام, and what it's telling the Prophet to do is demanding. You're going to start praying from sundown until it's the heart of the night and then you're going to stay up at night in Tahajjud. You're going to stay up, stay up at night in a vigil, praying. But we know from the historical record, although the Prophet ﷺ took this upon himself, performed it, for the rest of his life. And as we said that before that he would pray so often until his, his, his feet would become swollen and so on. But many of the Muslims, at, those Muslims who did not apostate and stayed with him in the midst of their persecution and misery, this is precisely what they started doing with the Prophet these long protracted prayer times in my view i've told you this before an islamic movement that dreams of a different future that does what a lot of unfortunately modern sufi movements do make it all about prayer but nothing about social awareness or political awareness is deeply flawed and any islamic movement that makes it all about political awareness and social awareness but doesn't learn how to anchor ethical principles through the medium of keeping visual at prayer is deeply flawed. This type of regime was necessary to create this the moral beings that are going to build the civilization. But then look at at eighty one. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَذَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ ذَهُوكَ we often recite this. This is one of the most famous Quranic revelations. It, you, it's, you know, in, in calligraphy, in, um, you know, among the most famous memorized, the most often memorized. By the way, the, the dhikr for the surah is 80. Um, before I forget, but anyway. 81, and say... The truth has come and falsehood has vanished because truly falsehood is ever vanishing. Okay, when was this revealed? 
This is revealed at the heart of the time when Muslims are being persecuted. No one pauses and thinks about this. Muslim, the, the Prophet ﷺ just lost his uncle, just lost his, his wife, was just expelled out of Thaqif. Was, was, the Muslims are being persecuted horribly. They're starving to death. And Allah tells the Prophet ﷺ to say, Truth has been established and falsehood has been vanquished. A lot of Muslims think that the, this was said when um, Muslims conquered Mecca. No, it was said at the time when Muslims were at, at absolutely the bottom. In order for you to take morality seriously, and to take prayer as a regime for ethical morality seriously, you must have that level of conviction that truth will prevail and falsehood will be vanquished. The thing that defeats people ethically the most is when they feel despair. A lot of people, and this is, by the way, a lot of people will, this is what life has, has taught me this. I've known people who were raised when they were, you know, young men in, in teens, in their early 20s. They, they had big dreams about the Islamic movement. And when they had big dreams, And although they would never say it out loud, but I'm sure that that's what they felt, they believed that maybe they're going to play a role in these big dreams about the Islamic movement. Back then, they would not fornicate or commit adultery or do a lot of things that were haram because they felt a sense of um, empowerment and a sense of optimism. When they started getting older and losing hope and seeing there's no point, all the things they dreamt of were not going to happen. They started also slipping. And when I would think about why they slipped I would realize it is nothing more than that sense of uh, does it well you know none of what we thought was gonna happen is gonna happen so you know maybe I've taken myself too seriously through life it is do you know that a lot of people that commit treason or betray they betray and commit treason. The first way you get someone to commit treason or betray is to convince them that whatever goal or whatever cause they believed in is a lost cause. That's how you first get them to accept the money to commit treason or betray. If you don't believe in Ja' al Haq wa Zahq al Batil, in al Batil akana zahuqa, that be and why? Only because you believe in God. That it is... Well, how do I know that falsehood will be vanquished? It's because God said so. But it has always struck me that... In, can you, when the, actually, when the Prophet ﷺ recited this, the Meccans laughed. Because... What, Van, what are you talking about? Truths have prevailed. And 
the bottom has been vanquished. Oh, but it's, oh, you mean you're the bottom? There's actually a hadith in Riwayah in which I forgot who it was told, told the Prophet, this would be only be true if you are the bottom. You've been vanquished. Okay. But then this is this this notion of of moral despair as as often the path of shaitan towards getting you to compromise ethically and morally is underscored in 83 that human beings have a tendency that when we give them, they start acting entitled. But when we test them, they despair. And again, remember that this is being told to Muslims at a time of severe hardship. كل كل يعمل على شاكلته فربكم أعلم بمن هو أهدى سبيلا. This is 84. كل كل يعمل على شاكلته. Um, it's translated each acts according to his disposition, which is again literally correct, but but not quite. Kullun yamalu ala shakilati is like saying um, you know it, it's if you have good manners you're gonna act well in a in a, in a good mannered way. If you have manners you're gonna act in a rude way. It's like it's not a disposition, it's like saying well you know, if if you stick to that pattern, it's because of a problem within. And what's the pattern? Pattern is that when you God gives you, you feel entitled. You feel I don't need God. And when God tests you, you despair. Okay. Okay. Now, after all of this, remember that point we said that where it has become clear in the Isra al Miraj that through that journey to Jerusalem, that this is the final message and the final prophet. And uh, this is it. The Quran is the miracle. And as Surah Al-Isra says that they demand, and as we also saw in Surah Al-Rad, that they demand, which the Meccans repeatedly demand, well, you know, why don't you uh, uh, give us a miracle like the biblical prophets? And after the Isra, the Quran is coming up with a challenge at, at again, a, a very difficult time for Muslims that it says, you know, this is it. You want the miracle? This is the miracle. And, of course, many responded to this by saying, how could that be? This doesn't make any sense that this is the miracle and that this is it for the prophets, the, the entire lineage, and not an, even an Israelite for that matter. And here comes, then comes the challenge that was a, um, enormous for that time especially, in 88, 
على أن يأتوا بمثل هذا القرآن لا يأتون بمثله ولو كان بعضهم لبعض ظاهرة. So 88 comes out and says if human beings all get together and the jinn get together to match this Quran they wouldn't be able to. Were there attempts to meet that challenge and to invent a text equivalent to the Quran? Absolutely. Numerous attempts. Some of them survived. Some of them were stupid. Some of them were eloquent. Um, but they all suffer from a common problem is that they're all variations on the style of the Quran invented. So they, they, they take the Quranic style and then they try to build a variant on it. But none of them, of course, survived. And, and these efforts, yeah, I told you that there was an attempt in the 80s uh, known as the Furqan, where these people spent thousands and thousands of dollars to print a, a, a Quran that matches the Quran called the Furqan. I have copies of it. And more recently, as recent as just a few months ago, uh, a Christian evangelist offered a huge financial award. I don't remember how much it was, a million dollars or something like that, to anyone who... Uh, writes or matches or surpasses the Quranic style. And submissions were sent to him from all over. And he went, uh, you know, he, he, he was, I don't know if he actually gave out the, the award to anyone, uh, but he posted a lot of the submissions and was bragging that they're as good as the, Qur as good as the Quran or better. Um, What matters is the challenge for Arabs at that time. I mean, it, it is for a, Quran, for a book to say, this is the miracle, and go ahead, match my style or match, my, match this book if you can, is just one of these marvelous things about the Quran that um, one of the one of the things that I'll never forget um, it was it was an Israeli historian and th I was in my teenage years and I was fond of, uh, of reading what uh, and th he's a historian orientalist because he wrote a lot about Islam and he he said um, he had this, uh, in a, in a, um, I, I have that book in my library. I know it's I can find it because it's it's in the library somewhere. Um, he, he's being interviewed in, uh, about um, uh, Muslims, and he's asked, you know, isn't Israel? And this uh, this was inter an interview uh, in the seventies. So he said, is, it, is, is Israel afraid, uh, is he worried about the fate of Israel being created in a sea of Arabs? And he said, he, he's not, I'm not worried about the, uh, the fate of, the, of Israel uh, being created in the sea of Arabs because um, these Arabs are like, disjointed warring tribes and that's their nature there will always be disjointed warring tribes and the only time they got together was under the Islamic banner but he's not worried about the Islamic banner because they all came together under the language of the Quran and so the man says, well, you know, well, if they came together under the language of the Quran, can't they come together under the language of the Quran again? And this guy said, and I kid you not, 
and we should find that book again and republish it. He said, no, because the relationship to the languages for the Quran, according to him, has been forever severed. They, they, they as Arabs can no longer understand the Quran uh, the way that their ancestors did. And so, it, it, according to him, it's over. You know, it, it's, a, it's a done deal. And that just struck me and stayed with me. Okay. So, the, and the point, notice at verse 93, the point that we were saying about the Meccans demanding uh, a miracle from the Prophet other than the Quran. So, they say, that we will not believe in you unless or until you have a house of gold ornament or you ascend to the heaven um, or we will not believe in you until you you ascend to the heaven and bring down to, unto us a book we can read say all oh, glory to, is to God am I anything but am I anything but a human being as a messenger, uh, uh, they're demanding a, a physical miracle, inc including, if not a house of, of ornaments, and, uh, and of course what they demand it differed at different times, but it was all of the same nature. Or that you ascend to the heavens and come down with an actual written, fully composed book, rather than um, this Quran, which was not a book that they that is composed from beginning to end. Okay. Ninety-three, ninety-four, ninety-five, just is a, is a confirmation of of what I was talking about: the demand for a miracle and how God says, "No, there, there is no miracle other than this Quran itself," and ultimately tells the Prophet ﷺ that, you know, told him, كَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ بِعَبَادِي خَبِيرًا بَصِيرًا that ultimately it is enough that God is your witness. Whether they believe you or not believe you, that's not the point. Just pay attention to the message that you have. Okay. Next, where a pause is warranted, is 104, verse 104. Surah Al-Isra goes back and mentions in talking about the, the this whole paradigm of miracles. It says that, you know, we, we gave Moses nine miracles and although they were miracles that presented to the people right there, it's a, that those who did not witness the miracles even those who witnessed the miracle still refused to believe. And, uh, even, and shortly after, those who did not witness the miracles, it was very easy for them to ignore these miracles and say, well, we didn't see them for ourselves, so they don't count. Okay. Then, 
in 104, it says, uh, don't look this up. وَقُلْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ اسْكُنُوا الْأَرْضِ فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ جِئْنَا بِكُمْ لَفِيفًا so we told the children of Israel Skunal Ard settle in various parts on earth. So when the promise of the hereafter comes Jina Bikum Lafifa the meaning of this is is um, uh, fascinatingly sort of a, it could mean that we in the hereafter will bring you from all the different parts of the earth to stand judgment in the hereafter. But then, if that's the meaning, well, that's going to happen with everyone else. So what's different about the people of children of Israel? Some have said, Jina Bikum Lafifa means that when the time for the hereafter comes close, Instead of being in different parts of the world, you will all be gathered in one part of the world. So those who read Surah Al-Isra as having a prediction as to what will happen with the Israelites in, in our age often point to this verse, Jina Bikum Lafifa, because it, it, it's... It literally means like we will gather you from different parts. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, as I said in last halakha, I'm, I'm very skeptical about reading the Quran as a historical predictor. Uh, but the expression "jina bikum lafifa." And the establishment of a Jewish homeland after all these centuries. It's an interesting point. I don't know, you know, what I ultimately think about it, but it's an interesting point. You, I'm sure you'll find on the net a lot of people who talk about this stuff, but just so, you know, Flagging things are worth uh, keeping in mind. Okay. Then we are approaching the the conclusion of Surah Al Isra. Wa Quranan faraknahu li taqra'ahu ala nasi ala muksin. وَلَزَّلْنَاهُ تَنْزِيلًا Let's see how they translate. 106. The Quran لِتَقْرَأُهُ عَلَى النَّاسِ عَلَى مُكْسٍ Um the, the expression looks or the study Quran translates it translates it as this is 106 um, that though you may recite it unto people in intervals but ana muks um, can mean that you recite it at intervals but but that's not the most um, direct meaning. The, the most direct meaning, ala muks, is 
you recite it to people as each revelation fits it looks is like when you fit a part to a part and it fits perfectly so it's like we you recite it at intervals so that a part as each part is revealed it fits into the reality to which it is revealed to why am i pointing to this this is one of the one of the parts of the quran that convinced me of the approach that i have been sharing with you that we must understand the surah as it comes into a context so if surah al-isra had the same discourse on ethics um in the medina period it would have a different impact than having the same discourse on ethics at the juncture of al-isra al maraj if it would have the discourse on ethics at the beginning of the revelation it would have a different impact and a different import and a different meaning and this is precisely what i see as the methodology of ala muqtin is that it is being you have to study how each revelation fit the circumstance so you can understand the point that god is making to you okay next go to 109 where or before where quluna subhana rabbina in kana wa'du rabbina maf'ula maf'ula wa yakhruna lil adqani yabquna wa yaziduhum khushu'a qul du Allah aw du Rahman ayyama tad'u falahu al isma'u al husna wa la tajhar bi salatik wa la tukhafid biha wa attaghi bayna dhalika sabila that the description here deserves a comment this is i'm just um, let's see how it's translated um one And they say glory be to our Lord the promise of our Lord is indeed fulfilled um and they fall down you know you know they they fall uh yeah you could, I guess you could say down on their faces uh khurun al asqani is we you where you fall down and your your uh chin you you crumble on the floor so much so that your chin touches the floor so when you go like, you know like this so and weeping and and with utmost humility um there is a again a, a narrative an occasion of revelation narrative that says that there were some people of the book christians and jews who especially jews and in, in most of the traditions that upon hearing the revelation of the quran saw in it the signs of the awaited messiah that is mentioned in the old testament and that when then the, that they followed the revelation and fell down weeping um, the problem was that narrative is that if it is authentic then most reports that it it occurred well late into the medina period 
uh, and Surah Al-Isra is Mecca. Um, but that expression, وَيَخُرُّونَ لِلْأَثْقَانِ يَبْكُونَ وَيَزِيدُهُمْ خُشُوعًا I'll put it out there. How many of us in our relationship with the Quran crumble to the floor weeping in complete humility with our faces touching the floor? If your goal is the ethical code that Surah Al-Isra, and remember that as like all ethical codes, it's gradations of fulfillment. You know, you could you could achieve the ethical code to an A plus degree, or you could see achieve the ethical code to a C minus degree, right? Um, it is healthy in the life of any Muslim at one time or another to weep tears because of their longing for God. I mean, of course, it's beautiful if you can do it regularly. You should never do it in public. No one should ever see you. Anyone that does it in public, I just... I have no respect for that. Um, so, you know, all of these shiuch that start bawling their eyes out as they're leading prayer, that's not what this is talking about. Um, if you've never experienced it, make it a goal to experience it. And it should not be done, you should not wait to do it when God makes a calamity smash down on your head. Because, yeah, most people do it when things are really, you know, things are not working out in their life. Um, if you're a smart person, you'll do it when things are working out beautifully in your life. And then, perhaps, you won't, that other scenario will never happen. Okay. Qul udu Allah aw udu Rahman. This is as I mentioned before that when the when the Prophet Salam mentioned Ar Rahman, Meccan said, Oh Muhammad tells us to pray, worship one God, but he worships two God. One God is called Allah, the other is Ar Rahman. And the Quran is saying, you know, whether whatever name of Asma'ullah you are reciting, um, the all the beautiful names, Asma'ul Husna, the 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 names of Allah that we know, they all equally apply to Allah. The Tajar Bisalat Kulat Khafadbiya don't raise your voice and don't pray too quietly. There is a tradition that's I've always thought sort of funny. I don't think it's authentic, but it says that Umar ibn Khattab used to pray out too loud. And Abu Bakr used to pray out too quietly. So the Quran was revealed to say pray out pray just right. And can you guess who was supposed to be Praying just right. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Imam Ali. Uh, that, that's that's what the tradition was. You know, Omar too loud, Abu Bakr too too low. Imam Ali just right. I, I don't know. I, I don't put too much weight on it. But. Um. Okay. And. 
so but what you know what what was the real reason for for saying don't raise your um um I mean, what what actual moral point do the commentaries say about about this? Is that um, well, to have the, the those who um, often when you you are not hearing what you're saying, what what starts happening is you actually. In your mind, you're reciting the fat how reciting the surah, but you because you're not actually pronouncing it, you're going so fast that you're eating the words. So if you've ever watched people pray, and you you know they say Allahu Akbar, and then you watching them, you start reciting the fat at the same time they're reciting it. And you're like, say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And then you see them go, Allahu Akbar. And you wonder, think to yourself, how in God's name did they read the Fatha so quickly? It's because they're, they're actually yeah, not, not, artic- not speaking it. So it's like, zoom. Uh, that, that's like, biha. that's the, the two. And uh, and don't not don't recite it too loudly. Is that you know don't make a show out of it. The the point is not to get attention to the whole world that you're praying. So anyway. وَقُلْ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذَ وَلَدًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِيٌّ مِنَ الذُّلِّ وَكَبِّرُهُ تَكْبِيرًا. That the closing of the ayah. And say praise to God who has taken no child. So again, the demarcation was the point of separation that the Quran insists on as the reaffirmation of monotheism. And who has no partner in sovereignty and has no partner in protecting people out of lowliness, meaning honoring people, that the, the, the only true source of pride and honor for human beings is the divine. وَكَبِّرُوا تَكْبِيرًا And proclaim God's greatness. So, to, to wrap up, Surah Al-Isra if you if you study Surah Al Isra in in its in its various symphonic moves, I often compare the Quranic Surah to like like pieces of of, of musical composition. The heart of it is that it told you it. It divorced the idea of its chosen ethnicity, its chosen race, its chosen tribe, going forward, which will be critical. Its chosen tribe wouldn't have worked in in a migration to Medina. Its chosen ethnicity wouldn't have worked in the hodgepodge community of Medina with all the different ethnicities that will join the Islamic movement. But as the Prophet ﷺ said much later on, that people are as equal as the, the, the teeth of a comb. Comb, com, how do you pronounce whatever. Com. I can't hear you, but um, I trust you've pronounced it right. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, uh, and that there is no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab, except by piety and so on, the famous hadith. Especially that it, what he repeated in his last sermon. This affirmed was what we said was the first racist was shaitan. And the first condemnation of racism was a condemnation of the, of the rebellion of shaitan. 
But then the ethical backbone of Islam, without which you're not going to build a society or a nation or a civilization going forward, but anchored in a relationship with Allah, anchored in an aversion to the demonic in life, with all that the demonic represents. And anchored in a relationship with the Quran as the, as I always say, as the continuing, the final but continuing revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, one of the uh, traditions that I um, that the Prophet والسلام, would say that Allah about the the, the 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 hardships of that period and it says Allah sent me a consolation that equaled that is greater than any other consolation and that's Surah Al-Isra and when when you understand Surah Al-Isra and you live with it and you allow it to penetrate through, you truly understand why that is. It, it um, although it, it, you know, can you imagine you are at this point in your life and you're saying truth will vanquish and falsehood will perish and which, I mean, puts you in a clashing course with, and and now you've separated yourself from Christians and Jews in a, in a very decisive and clear way, and, and so on, so And you've made these, the claim that you've traveled to Jerusalem and back, which, but, but what is your moral consolation? It's the surah, which is extremely powerful. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Okay. Alhamdulillah, I have to admit, I didn't want it to end. <laughs> um, so, well, let's take a quick break, and then if you guys want to send your questions through the chat, and then we'll come back and, and start our Q&A, inshallah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. This was really... Um, Powerful, and I mean, it's, it's it's like a momentous because it's like the hijra is a marking point, right? I mean, it's yeah. really. Um, so, would you say this is the end of the foundational? Yeah, I mean, after the well, after the there 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 are uh, there are Meccan sur, but there there. As we'll see, I mean, they, they deal with different issues um, or further refinements on the theme. Um, but one, one cannot overlook the, the rather ex extensive ethical code that is... And it's just a matter of how seriously do you take do you under do you, do you take this ethical code? Um. I think it's amazing. Like it's it's hard to ignore. Um, you know, even the point where you, you were saying how there's a context. You know, we have to understand how things were revealed. I feel that repeating here in our context because I feel like the messages that you know the, the surahs that we received in the in the order that they were presented were really valuable 
for our learning and our journeys, definitely here with the, the students in person, but just, you know, for our time. So it's so powerful. It's like the continuation, the, the continuing revelation that is, you know, when I think when we feel it, it's, it's just so special. Um, so alhamdulillah, thank you so, so much. Um, who would like to kick off Q&A? Ram. Uh, my question is about verse 85, uh, about the Ruh. Um, what's the significance of its being uh, revealed in the Surah? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? The, the question is about uh, 85. ويسألونك عن الروح قل الروح من أمر ربي وما أتيت من العلم إلا قليلا. Um, uh, the um, 85 is, is saying, and they ask you about the soul, and and it simply says, tell them the soul is of God's province or God's knowledge and you and so it doesn't it it effectively refuses to give a response about the the soul but other than to say that it is uh, something known to God and the um, the uh, the the importance of that is that the issue of the soul had, I mean, it's it's been uh, always uh, an issue, but for the Meccans, we have many reports in which the, the Prophet ﷺ is asked specifically about the human soul. And well, if... Uh, and, where does the soul come from? Where does the soul go? And what is the nature of the soul? And in there are in the although they're probably not known to the Arab uh, context that in the Greek tradition there were a lot of speculation about. The, the nature of the soul and what the soul is and so on. And the the Prophet is his is point is asked specifically about the soul. And the response of the Prophet is told to give the Meccans is that it is it effectively maintains that when it comes to the world of the unseen, the, the world of Ghaib, uh, the world of the Malakut, the world of the, 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 the realm, the dimensions that in which we do not dwell, um, there is a limit to our knowledge. And, and the Quran refused to lend any credence to the speculations about the soul. Um, now, why in Al-Isra? Um, I can imagine that if if you are in in short order, you're going to begin a a new journey where you are with a clearly defined faith. Um, you are removing certain things off the table, and um, and the 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 soul in all this time since 
from the from the first time that human beings began speculating about the soul to our very day, our knowledge of the soul has not increased one iota. I mean, it's remarkable that the Quran just states it so flatly, and um, and we are not in any better awareness of what the soul is than in the past. Um, but this this Quranic pronouncement about the soul is among the famous, very famous Quranic verses. That it is simply up to God. Only God knows what the nature of the soul is. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were gonna answer why you think it appeared here. No, the, just that that it's it it's like clearly defining what's off the table. I mean, you, you uh, and I and I think that, I mean it because when you when you say that you're also effectively. Um, the Arabs didn't know about a lot of the Greek speculative tradition about the, the soul, but you also made it for later Muslims, Muslims who are going to come much later, who are going to have access to the Greek tradition, made it illegitimate for them to engage in this type of speculation. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if you wanted to close the door on the tradition of occult practices mm. and occultism generally, that's a very effective way to do it. Um, the, um, the occult generally, whether the, the occult wants, wants to or not, ends up speculating about the soul a lot. And um, if you simply under, accept that speculating about the nature of the soul and what is the soul and uh, you know whether uh, it, yeah it, it just it, it's which I believe is very consistent with, with the way Islam dealt with the whole issue of occult that it just simply removed the it's like, you know, you, when it comes to the world of ghaib, uh, you accept as a matter of faith what you are told, what, what God revealed to you. Other than that, you deal with the world of, that you see and you touch, the created world. Thank you. Any other questions? And I'm wondering if verse 60, specifically the part about the accursed tree, could be understood um, in the same way in Surah Ibrahim, verses 24 through 28, when it talks about that the good word is like a good tree that can be planted and, and puts forth mm -hmm. that parable, rather than it simply, I mean, it, they're not mutually exclusive when they think about it, but just simply as a tree that you're going to see if you end up going to hell. Um, that, that's an interesting point. Um, I mean, if you look at verse 60, it says, وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَةَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ The, the, the tree that will occur tree in the Qur'an. Um, so, which is unusual for the Qur'an itself to say 
with Shajar al Mar'una and to, to refer to something in the Quran without actually naming it. Like it, it could have said Shajar al Zakum. Uh, instead of just saying the cursed tree in the Quran and then leave it to us to say, well, it must be referring to Shahrujat al-Zakum. This, the, what you're suggesting, is very, very common in Sufi-esque tafsir. That they, they, they often, no, like even among them is the tafsir and najmi itself. Uh, which is uh, in itself is, is among the Sufi tafsir, that they, because God didn't say it was Shajat al zakum in Surah Al-Isra, they see the reference to an accursed tree as, an, uh, as a reference to an accursed growth, an accursed dynamic itself, like, um, like going down a path, a road that from the beginning will lead you nowhere because it is a completely lost path. And you get some um, uh, uh, I mean some of the some of the, the, the readings of it um, that say you know that uh all of existence is as if an accursed tree, unless God rehabilitates this tree through the through the water of divine through the the literal water of divine revelation. That it's divine revelation that comes and brings life to the tree and so on. Um, anyway, yeah, but other, I mean, in the in non Sufi ask. It's, they always say it's, this refers to Shajrat al Zakum. Sufi ask the Fasir, it's not that they, they disagree that it refers to Shajrat al Zakum, but they say a deeper layer of meaning is that it's symbolic for an accursed path, uh, and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I have a follow up for Sharif's. Which Quran is it referring to? Is it the Quran, this Quran that we're reading, or is the Quran Akoni the the created mm, Quran? The created Quran. That's interesting. Yeah, I Can I you just repeat the question. I mean, in China, saying you know, is it is it saying um, a loan of Quran, a cursed, the 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 accursed tree in the Quran, is it referring to the revealed Quor this Quran, or is it referring to the created Quran, the the cre the Quran Akoni? And actually, I've, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, I, all the interpreters I've, I've seen, they've assumed that it refers to this Quran. Um, but I mean, again, uh, what the, 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 uh, the tree accursed in the Quran is ambiguous. Um, because the Quran, the, the revealed Quran, doesn't point to a tree and it calls it the cursed tree. It talks about Shajrat al Um And of course, the, 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 we have the narrative about the Meccans, you know, telling the Prophet, uh, how could there be a tree burning in, in hellfire and so on. And uh, you have that narrative. Um, but it's an interesting point. Any more questions? I'm, I'm curious why the Mi'raj is not mentioned in the Quran and, um, you know, when the Prophet said, I'm after the experience, like the one that he chose to share with the Meccans was the Isra and I mean, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm wrong on that point, but it does seem like, because the whole, they're out there, uh, you know, the reason why they were so, um, like, ridiculing the Prophet and the Muslims was over the Isra part and not the Ma'arash part. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I just thought that was a curiosity. Let me repeat the question. 
the uh, uh, other thing is that the the beginning of Surah Al Isra it refers to Subhanallah the Asra bi Abdi min al Masjid al Haram min al Masjid al Aqsa that Allah uh, carried the Prophet from the the Masjid in Mecca to the Masjid in in Jerusalem. Um, but it doesn't mention the Mi'raj part, where the Prophet ascends to heaven. Now, of course, the, the Meccans themselves, when um, um, they're, the part where they challenge, the, the or the part that they ridicule the most, interestingly, was not the, the part about the Mi'raj of ascending to the heavens, but the part about traveling from Mecca to Jerusalem in uh, a single night. And there, there are all these Hadith narratives that they say, well, if, if it's true that you did this journey in one night, then describe to us um, and, and they, they, you know, describe to us what, what Jerusalem, um, the the mosque in Jerusalem, look like. Uh, tell us, okay. So if you've traveled on the way, then tell us what tra what caravans are on their way from um, Palestine to Mecca. You know that are going to arrive in a day or two or whatever, and the prophet. Uh, does that, um, and of course it's uh, interesting that the Mi'raj itself is the part which has the most Hadith narratives, um, descriptive narratives about the Mi'raj and of ascending to the heavens. Um, The um, there is another. The, you know what is a lot of the r reports describing what happens in the mirage are um, are not of the highest authenticity. I mean, so the the report the, about uh, um, the prophet, the Allah uh, decreeing fifty prayers, and then the the prophet goes to Moses alayhi salam, and Musa says, "No, that's too much. To you, go back to God and ask them to lessen the amount of prayers," and and goes back and forth. That, that report, which all Muslims are taught at a very young age, is actually not, probably not an authentic report. Um, although, you know, they tell you Sahaha with Albani and all that stuff, but um, is... What is that? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. That, that basically, that the, the, the Hadith people, scholars of Hadith often declared it an authentic report, but it's not. Um, it, it's it's not of the level of authenticity where it can be accepted on something that is core to aqidah like that. That you know the the, the uh, Allah wants Muslims to pray fifty prayers a day, and then it's Moses that intervenes, and then it's lessened. I mean, it, it's um, a problematic report at many different levels. Anyway. Um, so we know about the Mi'raj as an event largely from the Hadith. Um, although we don't, we can't say that the details of the Mi'raj, uh, the parts of the Hadith that we can take as as reaching the level of Tawatur in terms of the details of the Mi'raj is very small. Um, 
So why does the why does Surat Al Isra mention Al Isra but not the Maharaj? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know, and I don't want to speculate about it. Um, there are some, you know, scholars who said, which in opinion that sort of became uh, extinct in the Islamic uh, tradition, that the Isra, the, these are among the Khawarish, for instance, who said that the Isra is part of Islam, but not the Ma'arash. Um, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I tend to believe in, in both the Isra and Ma'raj. Uh, but, but the Ma'raj is, um, it's an experience we have no frame of reference for. I mean, in other words, it, it's one of these ghaibiyat, um, what the Prophet Sallallahu witnessed uh, is like what Musa salam witnesses when a mountain crumbles uh, upon being allowed to, upon being, um, the divine being revealed to it. The, these are experiences that are the, the, the province of prophets. And they're not, it, 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 I, they're, um, they're very particular to prophets. That's why I'm, I'm skeptical of uh, a lot of the, the, in the Sufi tradition, they, they say that the, that one of the things about the Isra al Maraj is that if you follow the path, you, can elevate to the point where you can experience Isra al Maharaj yourself. I'm very skeptical of these types of uh, claims. I think they go too far. Uh, I don't think a normal human being who's not a prophet can have anything resembling the, the real Maharaj, uh, leave alone the Isra. So I just have a follow-up on your commentary on verse 81, understanding uh, the conviction that, you know, truth ho truthhood would be established and falsehood will be banished. Um, you kind of gave this anecdote about, you know, especially the youth, eventually, you know, they start off being so optimistic and so into Islamic movements, and then some despair hits and they just end up slipping. So obviously being amongst that group and, you know, seeing in the modern day movements like what's going on today, right now, for Palestinian liberation, I mean, not to be pessimistic, but even though it's been at unprecedented levels of, you know, activism and speaking out against it, we don't know if that's going to, you know, go back the way that it's been. So what is your recommendation, I guess, just generally speaking on how, you know, this kind of optimism and drive can continue? Of course, you know reading the Qur'an and understanding this message and internalizing it, but are there other steps that, you know, especially the Muslim youth can take in order to stay consistent? Yeah, you know, um... Can you just repeat that for... Uh, well, Ramin is saying about the, the uh, this whole issue of that a lot of people, what I was talking about, that a lot of people start out with the early on in life was a, a uh, 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 was a conviction that and that al batil al hawq and the zahr al haqq zahr al haqq wa dhaq al batil in al batil khair al hawq that that truth will prevail and falsity will vanquish and that as you get older the the um the pessimism, the um, realism, the um, um, skepticism, all, all of it starts coming in and then human beings then compromise themselves and start um, things that they wouldn't have done when they were young. Actually, they, they, uh, 
they they are uh, um, far more open to doing and and so on. And Rami is saying, well, what what advice do I have? Um, as a an antidote, I guess. Um, the, the, the I think it is really important that um, the youth do what's right and what's wrong, or learn to do what's right and what's wrong because it's right and because it's wrong. Um, to, to avoid doing what's wrong because it's wrong, and to do what's right because it's right, not because of a cal calculus of success and not success. And this is part of the problem when you are, you have a cause and then you, you're vested in this cause as a as a form of self affirmation for the self and you're hinging your self affirmation on the cause itself so you you find you find a, a sense of purpose in that cause and the cause will be successful so i will be successful um and in reality then what you really what you really committed to is yourself. It's not so much the cause. And when it becomes clear that the self is not going to um, prosper the way that you imagine, then all the compromises set in. Um, it is, and, and this is again, the educational process is really important. It is very significant that although Allah, although the Prophet ﷺ lived amongst Muslims, and although Allah was revealing the Quran to the Prophet, so often when it came to talking to Muslims who with the Prophet, the Quran would would not give them assurances. It would actually say things like, so if the prophet, if Muhammad is killed or dies, are you all going to go back as heathens? And well, Allah knew that Muhammad is not going to be, is not going to be, Allah knew that there's going to be victory. Allah knew all of that, but, but it is really significant that Allah always talked to them in terms of understand, be, being committed to the right thing, being loyal to the right thing, and not being not following Muhammad because uh, the you know the, what they're going to be in the Islamic movement when it finally becomes victorious, which is uh, often the what um, you know the, the, you find this with every. You know, when when you when you talk to so many of uh, and and we 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 feed into that by constantly telling young Muslims, you're the leaders of tomorrow, you're the leaders of tomorrow, you're the Islamic movement. So they they we build into their fantasies about what their role, and each one of them is going to be like an imam in the Islam. No one is going to be a follower. No one is going to be, a, you know, no one will have derivative roles of any kind. All of them are going to be leaders. Um, so it, it is, that's one thing, but then the other thing is that when we tell, teach them uh, that the truth will prevail and falsehood will vanquish, that it must be very clear that it is not on your, it, it, it's not on your timeline and it's not on your watch, but Allah's watch, and in Allah's timeline, and that it, you, as far as expectations should go, you should absolutely expect not to see the fruit of what you work for. That it, it, it is service for the sake for 
Allah's sake, where you do your job faithfully and loyally, expecting the reward, the relationship from Allah, but not expecting to see any fantastical results uh, in your lifetime or in any lifetime. That's not that's not your business. It's like the question of a ruh, the, 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 the soul. It's just not your business. Um, and if you if you actually look at all the all the people, all the civilizations that are successful in in uh, human history, they're the ones that have a a strong sense of duty and obligation because it's their duty and obligation, not because of estimates of failure and success. Um, um, you know, they're 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 like it's raising someone. It's like raising someone um, to respect their word just because it's their word as opposed respect your word when it when uh, depending on who you give your word to because you know some people it matters with other people it doesn't matter uh, the the more you train people to be calculating human beings the more you also train them to be unethical human beings um And this is um, uh, to the extent possible, you know. But uh, and and that's why I think up, upbringing makes. I mean, and and how you how you educate people really makes a difference. Because when I when I think of uh, the the experience I was talking about, um, you know, those who who always learned to have a steady relationship with Allah, um, regardless of, you know, the, the cause, the Islamic movement, the, uh, you know, the, whether there are ever going to be victory bells and, uh, they're the ones that that tended to stay the course um, the longest, and and you know just um, you know they're 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 steady but somewhat boring. Um, the you know and 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 it's consistent with sort of the the whole. Um, And, and, and this is a, an interesting point. That do you know that um, I've noticed also the those who get those who experience the the um, the sweetness of long periods of worship and a relationship with Allah early on. Um, are also the ones who tended to stay the course and not drift away or not compromise as they get older. Um, you know, nothing is foolproof, obviously, but these are all um, just healthy building blocks that um, that you know just do something because it's the right thing to do do your job because it's your job uh, whether uh, whether it's going to be success or not whether it's going to be a difference or not uh, that's up to god it's not none of our business do we know after this surah was revealed and after people apostated how many people were with the Prophet to make the Hijrah? 
I mean, we know that the uh, apostasies, there, there were there was considerable number, uh, not the majority. Uh, we don't have a percentage. I mean, we know the names of the people who apostated, and if if someone tracked the names, they probably can do a count. But um, some of them even apostated and later on came back to Islam. Um, after the Hijra, uh, some of them didn't apostate, but um, sort of became a bit wishy-washy in the sense that when the Hijra was announced, they did, they did not migrate. They stayed back in Mecca. Uh, they 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 made peace with the. So some of them continued to be Muslims, but sort of came to some type of accommodation with the Meccans. Um, um, in other words, they struck their own personal deal, which is a problem, obviously. So, you know, I don't know what percentage, um, but, you know, it, it was obviously enough, enough people to, to bother the prophet. My question was, how many people went on the Hijra? Um, well, you get different. Uh, uh, part of what the reason we get, uh, we don't know exactly, is that it there were there was the initial Hijra of a um, hundred people or so, but then several people continued to trickle. Do their own little small groups of Hijras um, afterwards until the Prophet ﷺ himself migrated with Abu Bakr and then after the Prophet there were a few, still a few others that continued, 30 people or so continued to trickle. So I'm not sure, I mean the number of Mahajirun I, I, I think would probably come out to 150 people or so. In total once they yeah. arrived there. Yeah. Amazing. Um, is there any more questions here before I jump into others? Um, okay, I have a small question and then a bigger question. Um, I remember when Sharif was really little and we, we used to get into this conversation that God created everything and then Sharif would say, well, what about things like cars or chairs or tables, right? Humans made that. But it reminded me of that when, in not today, but in last uh, Saturdays, um, you made a passing comment that chairs and tables also supplicate. Is that right? Or did I was I mistaken? Like when you talk about creation supplicating the Lord, like if we take a, ta a tree and turn it into a table or a chair, does it still supplicate the Lord? Oh, oh, I oh, did what you're saying. Yeah, the, this is uh, the, the the part of the 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 traditions that I don't know I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about the the um, there are hadiths that uh, it share that the that there are hadiths that the Prophet ﷺ would remark or that uh, okay there is a hadith not very authentic but that there was, um, um, I don't remember if it was a chair or a table or it was a piece of furniture, that it it had a, a whining sound. Um, and that the, the companions remarked about the whining sound of that thing, but it's not a very authentic <laughs> thing. Anyway. Uh, but then there are other hadiths that that uh, about the supplications or referring to the supplications of processed wood uh, or processed stone, like stone used in something. Um, And I'm not sure what to, my, my inclination is that if it's processed, it's no longer supplicating. But that's just an inclination. 
um, that w once it, human beings are are done with it. Although I remember uh, in the discussion some time ago, many many years ago, uh, someone told me you you assume that because you're too wedded to the human sense of reality that if you break things to the to their most essential components you know everything is made of moving electrons around so and and he says how do you know that the supplication doesn't occur at the level of the electrons uh, and I didn't have an answer to that so you know just but so I don't know I'm sorry, silly question, but um, then I want to ask actually a more serious question, which I um, continues on with the topic of trauma that we've talked about mm -hmm. in the past, um, because clearly one of the commandments is about being kind to parents. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that there are people who are wondering, well, what does that mean if I had parents who were extremely, you know, traumatic or, or were abusive? Um, what is then... Um, and, and not, you know, not just like unfair, but like seriously abusive, right? Um, what would you say to someone who's struggling with that kind of trauma? Uh, you have an obligation to... Um, you, you, like all principles, they are based all principles are anchored within a framework of principles. So you have an obligation to towards your to towards your parents as long as they do not re injure you. So a person who's gone through serious trauma, and I'm not talking about, you know, someone who had disagreements with their parents, obviously so but but serious abuse uh, they can do whatever rights whatever duties they owe towards their their parents um, as long as it doesn't re-injure them so as long as so for instance a a, a child of a parent uh, who committed sexual abuse or physical, especially sexual abuse is the most common one. Because physical abuse, it, it's more, you know, depends on the type of physical abuse and the extensiveness and so on. Um, well, obviously, you can't expose your own children to, because, you know, there is a very high chance that someone who checks if someone sexually abused their own children then they might sexually abuse their own girl children and you know parents who expose their grandchildren their own children to sexual abuse to by their parents and they say well you know i had well i couldn't help it because i had a duty to my father and i had to visit them with my children no that's insanity i mean i have no sympathy for that you have a duty to all. You have an obligation to protect your children, and if you know that your father sexually abused you, then you have an absolute duty to make sure that your children are not exposed to the same thing. If dealing with your father who has sexually abused you is going to re-traumatize you, and make you feel worthless, and make you feel um, have flashbacks, and uh, then. You, you, you know, you can pay whatever bills you need to pay for, you can provide whatever money you need to provide to take care of a parent without re-traumatizing yourself. Um, you know, the, it is, abuse is immoral. Let's remember that, that abuse is immoral. In the same way, that not being kind or not visiting your parents is immoral, let's say, or not communicating with your parents is immoral. But abuse is immoral. 
And uh, abuse is more immoral than not visiting your parents. So if visiting your parents means the reigniting or re-triggering of abuse, then no, then you don't, then you can't visit your parents and say, well, you know, I have a duty to visit them even if it's going to re-trigger me and, and, and especially the, the thing that drives me nuts is when I see parents that have exposed their own children to sexual abuse and because the, 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 the statistics are awful. Parents who sexually abuse their child are likely to check and sexually abuse their grandchildren. So you, you have an absolute obligation to protect your children. And it's not going to be a defense before Allah if you say, well, I thought I had to visit them and, and allow them to spend the night in my... No. You know, that Allah, it, it, we're not machines, unthinking machines that are put on auto mode. All morality is it is created within a paradigm of reasonableness and rationality. And if you are having a hard time thinking through what is reasonable and rational, then find someone that has ethical training to help you think through it. But this is um, uh, what what is always the case is that you, you can't abuse your parents and say, well, they abused me. You can't be cruel to your parents just because they were cruel to you. But you also cannot, your behavior cannot make disgusting conduct by, especially, and I'm talking about the, the exception that, you know, disgusting conduct by disgusting parents. Uh, you can't, uh, affirm that. You can't um, somehow, you know, make that okay. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Shreef, you have one, right? I'm asking this out of being a devil's advocate and for the sake of completion for the written tafsir, but is there any merit to the argument that Jerusalem is never directly mentioned in the Quran. Al-Aqsa means farthest place in the Hadith, only directly mentioned to correl or correlate Al-Quds, Jerusalem, to the night's journey. Hadiths are notoriously subjected even with the Snads. In Yazid's Jerusalem, Hadith comes 130 years after the Prophet. <laughs> and then we should pray. <laughs> Can you repeat okay. the question? Okay. Uh, I don't want to repeat it. Um, <laughs> uh, Did you guys hear the question? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. How do we know anything in history? Okay? How, uh, history, 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 <laughs> history. How do we know anything in history? How do we know? How do we know that? Iraq, well, how do we know that there are a people known as the Israelites? How about that? Who, who are the Israelites? Who, you know, how do we know that there is someone called Moses? How do we know it? it's because other earlier generations said so? Now, it's remarkable. These Arabs or Muslims or whoever they are, they um, astound me. They are willing to accept the most notoriously unreliable book, set of books, the, the Bible, Old and New Testaments, about the is Israelite tribes and God knows who they were, and if they had any connection whatsoever with modern Jews, whatsoever. They're willing to accept their claims about the land of Palestine. They're willing to accept the the, the the claims of the testimony of a people, the, the Bible, the Old Testament, was written not during the old the, the first temple, not during the the but by a people 
after the so-called destruction of the temple, most of the stories of the Old Testament are entirely fantastical. If you've ever bothered reading the Old Testament, they... But those Muslims or those Arabs are willing to accept the testimony of that book and generations of people far older than the generations of Muslims and on the basis of that say oh there was there was a temple in that location that wall that we call the Wailing Wall was actually the wall that belonged to Solomon there's no evidence to support that absolutely and that this land that we call Israel today is the land that is referred to in the Old Testament, etc., etc. Et but then they come to the Islamic part and they say, well, you know, the mosque says, when the, when the Quran says, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the far mosque, how do you know that it was referring to Isma Alam, to a, the, the using the name of an actual known mosque rather than just referring to a farther away mosque which makes absolutely no sense why would the Quran say far away mosque God couldn't point out what far away mosque so how how do we know that anything means anything well we know because we look at the historical record and see how was the Masjid al-Aqsa understood by the generations closest to the revelation of the Qur'an. And the very earliest tafsir that we have of the Qur'an says it is, this refers to the mosque in Jerusalem. That thing about Yazid 130 years later is a fiction from, is, from Israeli oriental scholars that Yusuf Zidan copied from and that idiot who's asking the question is copying from. What Yazid? Are you an idiot? Are you a moron? What are you talking? You think you can just invent stuff and someone like me is going to say, oh yes, oh wow, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I have an answer. What Yazid? Where did you get that from? Show me your evidence, you idiot, you moron, you ignorant idiot. What is wrong with you? When we read every Quranic tafsir that was ever written, every hadith that was ever commentator, and every Islamic source that was ever written, manuscript or published or otherwise, and it says Al Majid al Aqsa referred, when Umar ibn al Khattab, who lived at the time of the Prophet, went to Jerusalem and said, Ah, this is the Masjid al-Aqsa, and prostrated, praying. Build, let's, re, re, let's renovate the building that was here. This is the mosque that the Prophet came and visited during the Isra al Mi'raj. And an idiot like you comes and tells me, Oh, well, what did Omar know? What did Abu Bakr know? What, what did Omar or Ali or, or, or these companions know? You guys want to become colonial slaves. Go be colonial slaves, but don't corrupt our history. You have no honor. You have no dignity. You have nothing at all. Don't corrupt our history. Don't dare ask me a stupid, idiotic, moronic, retarded question like that again. My Lord. And on that note, it's a good place to end the halakha. Jeez. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Join us for Qunut prayer um, and also on Thursday, inshallah, for the conversation. And by the way, at Qunut prayer, we will pray for Jerusalem. For Jerusalem, for Al-Aqsa, whether you like it or not. For Al-Aqsa, because Al-Aqsa is Muslim. And it was Muslim and will remain Muslim till the end of days, whether you like it or not. Amen. Okay.
We'll see you soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.